Good afternoon and welcome to the Missouri Historical Review author series, where we ask authors to tell us about their work and the inspirations behind it. I'm John Brenner, Managing Editor of the Review at the State Historical Society of Missouri. With us today is Kelly Schmidt, author of Slavery and Shaping of, of Catholic Missouri, 1810-1850, uh, published last spring in our April 2022 issue. Uh, Kelly is speaking to us uh, live from St. Louis, where she is a postdoctoral research associate for the Washington University and Slavery Project. Her research focuses on a group of people that have been largely forgotten, uh, those who were enslaved by leaders and institutions of the Catholic Church. Kelly's article with us delved into how these individuals formed communities and, and resisted their enslavement, uh, despite the difficulty and injustice of their circumstances. Her work, like the work of other historians studying similar groups of enslaved people, recognizes their courage, uh, their strength, their accomplishments, uh, and their significant place in our history. Kelly, welcome to the State Historical Society, and thank you for joining us. Thanks so much, John. It's a pleasure to be here, and it's been so great to work with you and the team at the State Historical Society. Um, and I want to say thanks to all those who've joined today or who are watching later who have supported me in my work. And for the sake of time, I'll delve right into the presentation so we can have time for questions at the end. If you've ever visited the Cathedral Basilica of St. Louis, you may have noticed the mosaics adorning the ceiling are pretty unique. In addition to portraying Jesus, Mary, saints, and popes, the mosaics depict religious people, places, and events of local historical prominence who shaped Catholicism in Missouri, including Bishop Joseph Rosati, St. Rose Philippine Duchesne, Jesuit Jacques Marquette and Pierre-Jean de Smet, Vincentians John Timon and Felix de Andres, the Sisters of Loretto and Sisters of Mercy, St. Louis University, and the Old Cathedral of St. Louis. Even lay Catholic leaders who molded early Missouri grace its arches, namely Brian Melanthi, mayor of St. Louis and benefactor of its diocesan institutions, and Moses Linton, member of the St. Louis Medical Society and faculty at St. Louis University's med school. Another especially unique feature is that an archway near the entrance of the church features the seal of the city of St. Louis. I point out these, pe these features because I feel they represent who and what we remember and who we've forgotten in the history of Catholicism in this region. The city seal illustrates the way the archdiocese promotes how the early diocese, city, and state established in tandem shaped one another in their formative years. Indeed, the Archdiocese of St. Louis, which then encompassed the entire state of Missouri, much of Illinois, and the whole of the West, was established a mere five years after Missouri became a state in 1821. But while the mosaics feature several early white leaders who did much to shape the state and diocese, Black Americans are conspicuously absent, except in one instance as children experiencing the school desegregation instrumented by Cardinal Ritter in 1944. But even this image depicts Black Americans as recipients or beneficiaries of the actions of white clergy, aligning over the central role Black Catholics played themselves in pushing for desegregation. Indeed, a Black Catholic St. Louisan I know once remarked how when you look up in the cathedral, you just see all these white people. And she asked, where are we? She asked how we could incorporate artwork into this space that shows African-Americans, including her own ancestors, were part of this history too. What's little known about the locally revered leaders I name on the Basilica ceiling is that they were enslavers. And it was the people they held in bondage who did much of the labor that enabled these enslavers to shape Catholicism in the region, establish some of Missouri's earliest medical facilities, schools, orphanages, and charitable institutions, and help a newly emerging state take shape. My talk today gives an overview of how Missouri's 1821 entry into the Union as a slave state enabled the Catholic Diocese of St. Louis, founded five years later, to continue growing on the backs of enslaved people. In close collaboration with lay enslavers instrumental in shaping the early state, the diocese established several of Missouri's first schools, hospitals, and social welfare institutions. 
Enslaved families were wrenched apart in forced service to the state and diocese, but they took advantage of the region's Catholic heritage and changing laws to protect their kinship networks and pursue freedom as Missouri transitioned from colony to U.S. territory to state. My work only scratches the surface of this entangled history, and there's much more we need to uncover. Catholic missionaries and settlers were among the earliest European Americans to explore, populate, and introduce chattel slavery into the region that's now Missouri. Catholic presence in Missouri began in the 17th century as French Jesuit missionaries and fur traders populated the area to evangelize and do business with indigenous people. They soon invested in acquiring Native American enslaved people and later people forced on the Middle Passage from Africa to do labor to sustain the order's presence in the region. Likewise, many of the earliest colonial and American leaders involved in Missouri's growth, expansion, and transition to statehood, including the Shodos, Laquids, and Melanthes, were Catholic enslavers. For example, fur trader Pierre Cadet Shoto, who helped write the Missouri Constitution, enslaved Ferdinand, Odile, Pierre, Rosalie, Lucille, Julia Angelique, Pelagie, Eugenia, Cecile, Antoine, and George, among several others, who appear in the baptismal records of St. Louis's Cathedral. The Catholic diocese formed as Missouri transitioned from alternatively French and Spanish colonial land to U.S. territory and statehood, and its founders, experienced enslavers, intended from the start to support the diocese through slaveholding. Rich in Catholic heritage from its French and Spanish colonial occupation, Missouri transitioned to statehood at the same time the Catholic diocese was forming. Once a colonial missionary outpost, the region became part of the Diocese of Louisiana and the Floridas, and in 1817, the bishop, Louis William Valentin Duberg, moved his Episcopal see from New Orleans to St. Louis, just four years before Missouri was admitted to the Union as a slave state. As Duberg established his seat in St. Louis, he initiated a recruiting campaign of clergy and women religious to staff seminaries, schools, parishes, and other institutions, and immediately commenced building projects to expand the diocese. He supplied these priests, orders, and institutions with enslaved labor, moved enslaved people between congregations as he saw fit, and encouraged orders to bring enslaved people with them. His successor, Joseph Rosati, did the same as he established the Diocese of St. Louis in 1826. Enslaved people consequently experienced a series of ruptures from kin and place as they were moved among various locations on either side of the Mississippi River. In the wake of these ruptures, they built vast networks to withstand and with resist their enslavement. Enslaved people were central to the development of Catholic Missouri, especially in the crucial years when both the diocese and state took shape. In the 40 years surrounding Missouri's entry into the Union, Catholic institution building in the region, supported by slavery, developed rapidly. As late as 1840, St. Louis remained a culturally Catholic center, with Catholics constituting the city's largest denomination. As clergy, religious orders, and institutions and several of the region's most public figures exchanged land, money, and enslaved people, enslaved people's labor supported the diocese and the civic leaders, Catholic and non-Catholic, involved in Missouri's statecraft. The church and state's growth and dependence on slavery was mutually reinforcing. Missouri's entry into the Union as a slave state enabled the emergent diocese to continue growing on its slaveholding foundations as it built religious orders, schools, convents, hospitals, and asylums in Missouri, while Catholic citizens and statesmen within the territory were among those who brought the slaveholding clause of the Missouri Compromise to fruition. Preparing for a new bishop in the region, in 1816, Benedict Joseph Flage, bishop of the Diocese of Bardstown, Kentucky, compelled Missouri's parishes to determine to what extent they could supply the bishop annual income, furnishings, and servants, including enslaved people. Born on a coffee plantation in Saint-Domingue, Duberg, the appointed bishop, was already a practiced enslaver. As president of Georgetown University and founder of St. Mary's College in Maryland, he was involved in purchasing and selling people. Duberg envisioned supporting the new diocese with a large plantation, which took shape as St. Mary of the Barron Seminary run by the Vincentians downriver from St. Louis and Perryville. 
By 1819, Duberg, who owned the seminary and its property, had supplied the Vincentians with enslaved women for the kitchen and continued to acquire enslaved people for the, ordinator, for the order and coordinated with Vincentian leadership to purchase more. By 1830, the Vincentians were among the largest and wealthiest enslavers in Perry County. Enslaved people were also part of Duberg's contract with the Jesuits when he recruited them in 1823 to spearhead the diocese's mission to indigenous people. Duberg offered a plantation secured from a slaveholder in Florissant, Missouri, and stipulated that the Jesuits bring, quote, at least four or five or six enslaved people to be employed in preparing and providing the additional buildings that may be found necessary and in cultivating the land of the above mentioned farm. Accordingly, the Jesuits forced Thomas and Molly Brown, Moses and Nancy Queen, and Isaac and Susan Hawkins from their Maryland plantation. Enslaved people were present at all levels of the diocese functioning, living and laboring in the bishop's household, working and participating in religious life at St. Louis Cathedral, supporting the Catholic school, and attending to diocesan priests. Enslaved people performed manual labor for St. Louis Academy for Boys, founded in 1818, which is now St. Louis University. St. Louis University also benefited financially from slavery through donations and tuition dollars from slaveholding families. Major Thomas Biddle, who held 12 people in slavery, hosted a gathering in his home to persuade leading citizens, most of whom were enslavers, to raise funds for a new college building. Faculty and students brought enslaved people to campus, often sending them on errands. Enslavement was likewise integral to the founding of the St. Louis Medical Society, which was founded, at SLU's, founded as SLU's Med School. In 1835, St. Louis University's trustees resolved to, quote, petition the United States government through Senator Thomas Hart Benton for a grant of public land as an educational endowment, end quote, and consult with local doctors about establishing a medical faculty. Accordingly, the St. Louis Medical Society was founded in 1836, which in turn established St. Louis University's med school, both the first, kind, first of their kind west of the Mississippi. The members, trustees, and faculty consisted of doctors from different religious denominations, and several were local leaders and enslavers, influential in shaping the early city and state. Among them was Moses Linton, a Protestant convert to Catholicism who became president of the Medical Society, was a professor in the college's medical department, and established the first medical journal in the West. He held more than seven people in slavery between 1850 and 1860. Beyond holding people in slavery, these doctors obtained black bodies for anatomical study. Beginning in 1835, Missouri law permitted enslavers to donate enslaved people's bodies to medicine and allowed medical facilities to acquire bodies of black people who had been executed. Some institutions even disinterred black bodies from local cemeteries. When a riot ensued at St. Louis University's Medical College in 1844, after children had purportedly discovered a pile of appendages lying uncovered in the courtyard, the limbs of Black adults and children were said to have been strewn throughout the heap. The riot led to the closure of St. Louis Medical College, after which it became the independent St. Louis Medical College in 1855, later affiliating with Washington University in 1891. The Melanthes and Biddles were among several prominent Missouri families involved in the exchange of enslaved people that supported Catholic institutions. Missouri's first millionaire, John Melanthe, used the wealth he had derived from slavery to establish the Sisters of Charity in St. Louis and help them found the state's first hospital and orphanages, to which Bishop Rosati supplied enslaved people. Melanthe's daughter, Ann Biddle, temporarily offered her home and the people she enslaved to both the Sisters of Charity and the Sisters of the Visitation as she donated her wealth and land to help them establish permanent institutions. In addition to helping found the first hospitals, orphanages, and federal bank, Melanthe left money to support several of St. Louis's Catholic institutions, including the Sisters of Charity, and bequeaths Francis Michael, called Fanny, a four-year-old enslaved child to the sisters, having sent her mother Hannah away for supposed improper conduct. Melanthe was likely Fanny's father. 
When Fanny was eight, Hannah was murdered by Melanthe's son-in-law, Colonel William S. Harney. Melanthe's will, which emphasized that he had locally established the Sisters of Charity on a foundation he created, stipulated that they, quote, learn Fanny to read and write and treat her kindly and set her free at 18, quote, provided she shall have in the meantime conducted with propriety. He further allocated $200 for Fanny to receive once she married, quote, some decent orderly person in freedom. However, his daughter Ann Biddle and the Sisters of Charity sent Fanny to the Visitation Sisters as they settled in Kaskaskia after 1833. In April 1839, Biddle wrote Rosati that she had intended to leave Fanny with a visitation for a while and then, quote, take her home and have her taught dressmaking with a view of enabling her to support herself respectably in freedom. Yet when she wrote to the Visitation Sisters to retrieve 10-year-old Fanny, she found Rosati had authorized them to detain her. Accordingly, Biddle requested that Rosati write the sisters to send her the child as soon as possible. Fanny was eventually returned to Biddle and later set free for a sum of $1 in 1845. John Melanthe's son, Brian, co-founded the first chapter of the Society of St. Vincent de Paul in the United States at the cathedral, as well as homes and societies to aid immigrants and travelers, even leaving one third of his wealth to the city in trust for their aid. Brian Melanthe had served as a St. Louis alderman, circuit court judge, and mayor, and also held more than eight people in slavery. Like her father, her brother, and her husband, Thomas, Anne Biddle funded the opening of several churches and loaned and donated property and money to Catholic religious orders, getting their start running schools, hospitals, and orphanages, at times placing her own enslaved people at their disposal, as she did for the Sisters of Charity and Visitation Sisters. After Rosati compelled the Viatorian order to start a preparatory seminary in Carondelet, Biddle made her home available to them for two years. When she died, her estate inventory listed two women, Fanny and Louisa, a man named Bill, a child named Amanda, and, quote, one slave, a boy named Henry, believed to be out of the state, in Texas in the service and possession of Colonel William S. Harney, alongside her furniture. The bishops, clergy, and religious orders of St. Louis cultivated a system of exchanging and sharing enslaved people among themselves to build the diocese in the state, often even using enslaved people as collateral for debts, including those from purchasing enslaved people. This process of forced exchange is exemplified by the experience of the Nesbitt family. Across several generations, the Nesbits were separated for the service of clerics and religious orders in the Diocese of St. Louis and New Orleans. When Catholic religious shared the labor of enslaved people, they tore families apart. The record begins in 1822 when Bishop Duberg purchased Henry and Jenny Nesbitt and their nine children, a number that would grow in the years to come. Duberg initially planned to send the family to labor for the recently established Jesuit mission in Florissant. Instead, Duberg diverted the Nesbits to Perryville to toil at the Vincentian Seminary. Over the coming years, Duberg and his successor, Joseph Rosati, capriciously moved members of the Nesbit family to other religious in the diocese. Charles Nesbitt, Henry and Jenny's eldest child, was regularly sent between Perryville and the bishop's residence in St. Louis, where he served as the prelate's cook and personal attendant, accompanying him on trips through Missouri and Louisiana. In Perryville, Charles married Araminta, and together they had Mary Ann, Stephen, and Elizabeth. Charles continued to be forced to make the approximately 80 mile trek between Perryville and St. Louis, sometimes with his family and sometimes separated. Their nomadic life meant that Mary Ann and Stephen were baptized in Perryville and Elizabeth in St. Louis. In 1831, Rosati exchanged Charles's sister Mary and her two infant children, then in St. Louis, with Araminta, Mary Ann, and Stephen, presumably to unite most of Charles Nesbitt's family in St. Louis. Any time together, however, was short-lived, for in March 1836, Rosati loaned Charles to, Kaskaskia, or to Cahokia, Illinois, to paint, plaster, and whitewash a house Rosati bought to serve as a convent for the Sisters of St. Joseph. 
By July 1837, Rosati had placed Charles under the charge of Reverend Joseph Anthony Lutz, who tried to pass him on to the Jesuits, but instead hired him as a cook to a man named Mr. Leonard for a year. Charles attempted to escape three months later, but Leonard sent the constable after Charles, who captured him and imprisoned him for three days. Like Charles and his sister Mary, many of their other siblings were similarly wrenched from their family to serve the region's expanding Catholic institutions. De Berg gave Eliza Nesbitt to the Religious of the Sacred Heart in Missouri shortly after purchasing her, and the sisters brought Eliza with them when they founded St. Michael's Convent in Louisiana. In 1831, Rosati sold Sarah Ann to Father Charles de la Croix in St. James Parish, Louisiana, and attempted to sell Andrew to de la Croix as well, but Andrew missed the steamboat that would ship him downriver, possibly intentionally. Negotiations over the price for Andrew then dragged his sale out for two years before Andrew was eventually passed among several clerics in Louisiana. William was in Bishop Rosati's household as early as 1831 and remained until Rosati's death in 1844, substituting as cook in Charles's absence. Peter Augustine had been sent to serve the bishops in St. Louis and was known to be a, quote, fine tenor in the cathedral choir, but in 1832, Rosati sold Peter Augustine to Reverend John Boulier, who was then stationed at a parish in Old Mines, Missouri. Peter Augustine was later returned to the seminary where he married Helen Leona, and their family was later sold to Luther Taylor in Perryville. Clement and his wife Louisa refused to let themselves and their children be sold to a Catholic enslaver in Louisiana in 1843, but were subsequently forced to Galveston, Texas to serve the new bishop, Vincentian Jean-Marie Odin. As church leaders scattered their descendants across Missouri and the United States, Henry and Jenny Nesbitt remained susceptible as well. Around a year after Jenny died in 1829, Henry remarried to Minty, enslaved to Walker Wilkinson in Perryville. Minty was soon purchased by the seminary, and in 1836, the Vincentians sent Henry, Minty, their daughter Juliana, and Henry's son Dory to their church at Cape Dorado to help prepare a farm. Elizabeth Nesbitt was eventually sent to Cape Dorado as well. They all remained there until at least 1850, when Henry died after a tornado swept through southeast Missouri. These patterns of sale and exchange among Catholic religious shattered enslaved families. Many of the Nesbits were never able to reunite. But because they were transferred within Catholic circles, they built a wider kinship network allowing them to receive word of family after forced transfers separated them. As people enslaved to Catholics were passed from one entity to another, often in and out of free territory, they relied on these kinship networks and shared knowledge of Missouri's changing laws to resist enslavement. Such efforts are apparent in the experiences of Charles Nesbitt and Aspasia Lecomte, whose enslavement to Bishop Rosati briefly overlapped and who both sued for freedom in Missouri's courts. Charles and Aspasia drew upon each other's experiences and supported one another and their kin as they argued they were free according to the laws of Missouri and the Northwest Territory. Changing legislation shaped life for enslaved people like Charles and Aspasia and their networks in Missouri. During the French colonial period, the Code Noir, or Black Code, confined enslaved people's movements and choices, designated punishments for infractions, and enforced Catholic religious practice. Enslaved person, enslaver, and overseer could be punished if an enslaved person was not baptized or refused to practice Catholicism. In adherence to the law, enslavers typically brought enslaved people to baptism, often standing as sponsors themselves or choosing a relation or peer to do so. However, the religious dictates of the Code Noir offered enslaved people some protections. Many were motivated to practice Catholicism because it recognized marriages performed within the church and enabled enslaved people to fight having their families torn apart. In contrast, enslaved marriages in the British colonies were not legally protected. When Missouri passed under Spanish colonial rule, the government maintained practice of the Code Noir. 
Missouri's transition to U.S. territory, then statehood, shifted the laws on slavery and made enslavement harsher and more racially codified. While the Code Noir no longer applied, Missouri's Catholic residents still culturally followed it, providing enslaved people access to the sacraments and somewhat acknowledging the prohibition against dividing marriages. While enslavers and their families continued to bring enslaved people to baptism, enslaved people, many now Catholic for generations, increasingly chose their own kin as sponsors at baptisms and marriages, especially as they obtained a greater modicum of choice in their conversion. This choice of sponsors helped to strengthen their kin network in the region's Black Catholic communities and potentially prevent further separation by substantiating relationships not recognized by their enslavers through ritual. As transfers within the diocese's vast Catholic network separated families and communities, the ties of sacramental kinship transcended confines of space and helped enslaved people build a network among Catholic kin. This ensured they would find welcome through their kin's extended ties when forcibly transferred between places and that they could entrust their family to kin who remained when forced from them, as was the case with the Nesbits. Having extended kinship networks throughout the region also offered protections as enslaved people moved as couriers or escaped through free territory. Moreover, rather than having a decentralized community, the spiritual dimension of Catholic bonds of kinship often made people enslaved to Catholic religious the centers of kin communities within a neighborhood due to the reputation of several as spiritual arbiters with access to religious resources, rituals, and teaching. I've begun to map these networks by tracing relationships recorded in Catholic baptisms, marriages, and other records, and you can see the results so far on the screen. People who were enslaved to religious and clergy in the Catholic hierarchy are represented in blue. Other enslaved people, many who had Catholic lay enslavers, are seen in yellow. While incomplete, this relationship network visualization shows the ties enslaved communities shared with one another by blood, by relationships of kinship they strengthened through sponsorships, sponsorships at baptisms and marriages, and by virtue of living and laboring on the same enslaver's property. Tight clusters indicate subcommunities of people enslaved within particular regions or on particular properties who have spe especially tight kinship ties. For example, this cluster of dark blue represents the kin community of people enslaved to the Jesuits in Missouri in Florissant, who have ties with another subcommunity of people enslaved at St. Louis University. This light blue cluster shows some of the community network of people enslaved to the Vincentians in Perryville. And when I zoom in, you can see the Nesbitt family in network with one another and with fellow enslaved people, even uh, sharing several sacramental ties. I can also filter this program to show the Nesbitt's immediate network. The way I'm able to map these relationships is largely by documenting family and sacramental ties in Catholic baptism and marriage records. This represents a typical baptism record for an enslaved person in Missouri. It says, August the 17th, I baptized Joanna Harris, colored child daughter to Alan Harris and Liza. The former belongs to Mr. January, the latter to the novitiate, that is the Jesuit seminary and farm, born on the 15th of this month, godfather George Tyler, godmother Mary Queen. What can we learn from this record alone? Well, we learn a few family ties, such as that Joanna is the daughter of Alan Harris and Eliza Harris. We also learn that Alan Harris is enslaved to a man named Mr. January, and that Liza Harris is enslaved to the Jesuits. Because the status of an enslaved child followed that of the mother, we know that Joanna Harris is also enslaved to the Jesuits. We also have two sacramental ties, a godfather, George Tyler, and a godmother, Mary Queen. From this record alone, we can't infer much more about who they are, but by comparing all of the sacramental records in the same register with one another and with Jesuit records they kept on the management of the people they enslaved, I can determine that George, Tyler, and Mary Queen were also both enslaved to the Jesuits and were extended family members of Joanna's mother, Liza, or Elizabeth, whose, married, whose maiden name was Queen. <clears throat> 
on my network visualization, I can use these ties to draw lines connecting the nodes that represent each person. So here's the one degree relationships I've mapped for Joanna, and I can expand it to show her two degree network and beyond. Next, let's look at a typical marriage record for an enslaved couple. This one reads, October the 30th, we're lawfully married before me, Richard Hammond, black servant to Mr. Charles Chambers, and Anne Queen, black servant of St. Stanislaus, alias the priest, Fonts, the same Jesuit seminary we saw before. In the presence of Josie Queen and her sister attendants, also Thomas and Messiah's Chambers. What can we learn from this one? We can draw a bond of marriage between Richard Hammond and Anne Queen. We know that Richard Hammond is enslaved to Charles Chambers and Anne Queen is enslaved to the Jesuits. Now let's look at the witnesses, Josie Queen and her sister attendants. While it's not immediately evident whether the sister is Josie's sister or Anne's sister, we note that Josie and Anne share the same last name, Queen. From related records, we learn that they are also enslaved to the Jesuits in our family of Anne's. Likewise, we have Thomas and Messiah's Chambers. They share a surname with the enslaver Charles Chambers. And it could be that these are Charles Chambers' children or relatives, as family members of enslavers sometimes stood as witness at sacraments, or they could be people enslaved to Charles Chambers and are referred to by his surname. This would require further research into census records and Chambers family papers to find out. But here's what we're able to map from it and other sacramental records uncovered about the, the um, Harris family, Hammond family. As you can see, they had several children and witnessed several marriages. And as you'll see, as we expand out, the Harris family who we saw in the baptismal record and the Hammond family we saw in the marriage record are, not, are united not only by extended family ties, but by kinship they strengthened by Elizabeth, the Liza we saw in the baptism record, calling upon Anne Queen to be a witness at her marriage. As we zoom out, you see that other sacramental ties connect the two families as well. Enslaved people drew upon the networks they built to support one another in pursuing freedom, including by suing in Missouri courts as their Catholic enslavers exchanged them. Relationship networks were also communication networks. As enslaved people exchanged information about pertinent laws and events or strategies to freedom, those who bridged multiple communities bore information across sub-communities. The same community formation and communication exchange in the wake of separation is seen in the families of Charles Nesbitt and Aspasia Lecomte. Earlier, I mentioned Charles and Ara Minto Nesbitt, a couple alternatively enslaved to the bishops and the Vincentians, who consequently spent time in slavery in Perryville and St. Louis, building networks in both places. These networks sustained them, especially when they were made to live apart, Ara Minta at the seminary and Charles in St. Louis. In Perryville, Charles and Ara Minta strengthened their kinship with people enslaved at the seminary, evidenced in their roles as sacramental sponsors as indicated by the purple arrows on the screen. Together, they were witnesses to the marriage of Ignatius and Serena, a couple enslaved to Rosati, and were godparents to the baptisms of four enslaved family members, neighbors, or kin in Perryville and St. Louis. They also joined relatives and neighbors in sponsoring family and kin enslaved at the seminary and neighbors on adjoining properties. In St. Louis, Charles was a godparent six times with other godmothers, and one of these fellow godparents was Aspasia Lecomte, a woman passed through several enslavers before becoming enslaved to Bishop Rosati. In the bishop's household and through the sacraments, Charles entered into community with Aspasia, joining the network she and her family had crafted in the city. Aspasia remained connected with her mother, Judy, siblings Celeste and Toussaint, and Celeste's children, even as they were separated and sold from one enslaver to another. While enslaved to the Menards, Aspasia was a godmother to her namesake, Marie Aspasier. And even after she was sold to Bishop Rosati, she became the godmother to Sarah, another person enslaved to Bernard Pratt. 
and she was the godmother of five other enslaved people while enslaved to Rosati. The social network in which Aspasia's family operated was so close-knit that John Baptiste, enslaved to Bishop Rosati's attorney, was the godparent to her sister Celeste's son, Leonti. You can see him here on the map. Here's Leonti, also called Louis. Through John Baptiste's sacramental and kinship ties to Lewis, when Aspasia uh, later sued for her freedom with Wilson Prim, John Baptiste's enslaver as defendant, it's possible that through John Baptiste's sacramental ties and kinship ties to Lewis, the family may have gathered knowledge of legal culture and defendants' plans during their suits through the whisperings of people enslaved in Prim's household. Just as Aspasia had learned from her own kin community, after Charles became part of Aspasia's social world in St. Louis, he drew upon the network's experience of suing for freedom. Aspasia Lecomte had already been involved in five legal battles to try to obtain her freedom before Bishop Rosati claimed her as property. Aspasia, her mother Judy, her siblings Celeste and Toussaint, and their children had been separated by being exchanged among several Catholic enslavers, first in Kaskaskia, Illinois, and then in St. Louis and St. Charles, Missouri. Aspasia and her family kept track of these involuntary movements, using their histories and the knowledge they acquired of Missouri and Illinois law from their network to sue for freedom. They argued that by the Northwest Ordinance of 1787, which had outlawed slavery in Kaskaskia and the territory north of the Ohio River, they were entitled to freedom because Judy had lived and labored there. The family bolstered one another's claims for freedom by successively filing suits centered on Judy's history in the Northwest Territory, adapting their accounts as they learned from one another's successes and failures. When Aspasia sued her enslaver Pierre Menard of Kaskaskia for freedom, Menard used his French Catholic heritage to argue he was legally able to hold Aspasia and her family in bondage in Illinois, even though it was a free state. When France ceded its territory west of the Mississippi to the British in the Treaty of Paris in 1763, the British had guaranteed that slaveholding could continue among French settlers in the territory. During the region's transition to U.S. territory, American legislators sought to appease disgruntled French residents by allowing them to keep the people they held in slavery prior to the Northwest Ordinance while forbidding the further importation of enslaved people into the state. Menard used this exception for French slaveholders in his argument that Judy, Aspasia, and their family were legally held in slavery by a Frenchman who was a citizen of Kaskaskia before it had become part of U.S. territory in 1787. The case went all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court, which dismissed the suit in 1831, holding that the case was not within its provisions to judge and the trials returned to local courts. Subsequent sales impeded Aspasia's suits. By April 1834, she was in Rosati's possession, joining Charles in the bishop's household, and together they were godparents for Isaac, an enslaved child, in October 1835. Aspasia resued Rosati for freedom in March 1837, but Rosati sold her to Hardage Lane, professor of obstetrics and diseases of women and children at St. Louis University to halt the suit and protect himself from financial loss. While enslaved in the bishop's household with Aspasia, Charles Nesbitt had opportunities to learn insights from her experiences in court. When he sued for freedom in 1840 on the basis of having been previously sent to labor in a free state, he drew upon the laws of Illinois and Missouri and the precedents of hundreds of enslaved and free St. Louisans. He learned legal options and effective strategies from free and enslaved people with whom he worked and attended services. They shared their experiences, contacts, and legal knowledge. Charles's petition and plea of trespass followed a similar formula to Aspasia's and others, demonstrating familiarity with the legal culture of freedom suits. Shortly after Charles filed suit, Rosati left town and appointed Jesuit Peter Verhagen to supervise Charles, forcing him to withdraw his suit against Rosati and refile against Verhagen. 
As the suit dragged on, Verhagen and Rosati impeded it by attempting to sell Charles, hiring him out to a cook on a steamboat on the Mississippi, thus removing him from the court's jurisdiction and preventing him from meeting with counsel in the same way Rosati had disrupted trial proceedings when he sold Aspasia. Rosati pressured key witnesses to evade court and change their testimony. While Charles appears to have won his freedom, what became of him and his family remains unknown. Charles Nesbitt's freedom suit demonstrates how enslaved people took advantage of their forced exchange across state borders in service to Catholic religious, and how they drew upon others in their network with whom they had formed sacramental ties and using the precedent of previous suits and regional legislation to obtain their freedom. As their journeys show, Charles Nesbitt and Aspasia Lecomte had been able to secure their freedom through the wherewithal and knowledge they acquired through the community they forged during their forced relocations. The Catholic network they cultivated supported them in their suits and acted as conduits of knowledge as they strategized. They drew upon the legacies of Catholic laws and rituals, as well as the networks they forged within Missouri's Catholic enslaved community. As seen in Charles and Aspasia's experience, the bonds they built with fellow enslaved people through shared worship spaces, religious fraternities, and sacramental ties helped them build knowledge, resources, and support to pursue freedom. Putting Charles and Aspasia's suits in conversation with church records reveals one of the ways in which, through sacramental ties and exchange in Catholic households, working in network to sue for freedom played out. The narratives of the Nesbits, Lecomps, and other enslaved people emphasize the communal nature of owning enslaved people among Catholic enslavers in Missouri. While transfers within Catholic network with networks of enslavers were commonplace, these exchanges within church hierarchy and among Catholic religious often operated as if part of one unit or institution. Moreover, as the Nesbitt and Lecomte suits show, enslavers worked with their Catholic network and through contacts influential in state and city governments to impede suits. Enslaved people's Catholicism and exchange within Catholic communities in Missouri unified networks over large distances, allowed information to spread more widely, and helped enslaved people ensure they had solid kinship networks when sold or transferred. Enslaved people were foundational to the development of Catholic Missouri. New state laws made continued enslavement within the emerging diocese possible, while legal shifts from the Code Noir to more entrenched racial restrictions in American statehood had tangible repercussions for Catholic enslaved people. While enmeshed in a system of exchange in which they were shared by Catholic religious groups who built educational, religious, and social welfare institutions that shaped the early state, Enslaved people forged community, were agents of their own faith, and enacted resistance as they sustained Catholicism's missionary and educational expansion west. Enslaved people in Missouri existed on borderlands shaped by Spanish, French, Native American, and African influences, where the line between freedom and enslavement was often blurred. Before Missouri became a state, these cultural influences gave enslaved people some room to exert choices over their lives. The Code Noir, for instance, provided enslaved people more opportunities for mobility and family preservation. As Missouri transitioned into American statehood, legislators codified more restrictive regulations to control enslaved people, but vestiges of former French codes survived. Enslaved Catholics relied on these lingering practices and sacraments to surmount Black codes that further limited freedom in Missouri by forging community networks that helped them collectively overcome their bondage. They took advantage of Catholic moral traditions and old and new laws to challenge slavery, both extra-legally and in the courts, reshaping the culture of slavery in early Missouri. The stories of the Nesbitt, Lecomps, and other enslaved people exchanged among state and Catholic leaders elucidate this history, contributing to a more comprehensive and truthful mosaic of this juncture in Missouri and the diocese formative years. Thank you so much. Uh, and with that, I'll turn it back over to John to field questions. Thanks so much, Kelly. That was a great presentation. It's, it's really fascinating to see what you do with those kinship networks and, and mapping them out. Um, 
I'd like to take just a moment to uh, thank uh, the archives of the Religious of the Sacred Heart and Sister Carolyn Ozick uh, for allowing us to include the photo of Eliza Nesbitt that uh, we saw earlier in the program. Um, and as always, a, a special thanks to the uh, members and donors to the State Historical Society. Um, without your support, programs like this one would not be possible. Uh, let me see. If it does look like we have some questions here. Uh, so let's get to those. Are you ready, Kelly? Yeah, I'm ready. Okay. Uh, Melissa Blank asks, are you factoring in the nationality of the enslavers into your research? Um, most of the names you have listed were French colonials. Have you noticed a difference among different nationalities of Catholics? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've been looking into the nationalities of some of these enslavers. And here, especially in this presentation, a lot of those enslavers were French. But I've also done a lot of work on communities enslaved to the Jesuits in Missouri. And a lot of those Jesuits were initially Belgian and French and later were more Irish and German. And I do think the nationality of those enslavers affected the way they acted as slaveholders, whether they were forcing enslaved people into Catholicism, whether they were following or disregarding some of these laws in the Code Noir. Um, and you also see some of these Jesuit enslavers who are coming from Belgium, initially not being familiar with slavery in an intimate way and being uncomfortable with it and questioning it. But then as they become more and more entrenched in American practices of slaveholding, their views begin to change and they question it less and increasingly try to justify it by saying, um, we're doing something good for enslaved people by providing them access to the Catholic faith. Whereas their contemporaries in France and Belgium beginning to question and speak out against slavery and outlaw it in those regions. But those connections, while informing their work, weren't necessarily always transferred. Um, there's a, there's a, a Jesuit here in Missouri who cites a French text by a theologian and philosopher um, and that theologian and philosopher is actually making a case for why slavery is wrong, but he um, misreads it and cites it to justify why the Jesuits are holding people in slavery in Missouri. So there is exchange across those transnational networks, but over time, um, the practices of these Catholic enslavers, well influenced by Rome and places in Europe and South America and elsewhere, become increasingly Americanized. Uh, we have a question from Taylor Libert. Um, I would like to know what software Dr. Schmidt used for her analysis and if she has participated in or has knowledge of the Digital Humanities Lab at Washington University. Yeah, so the software I use is called kumu.io. Um, if you are an educator or a student, you can use it for free, and it's very uh, user-friendly, which is great for me and the audience I'm hoping to reach. Um, so you can visit my network visualizations there in their incomplete state at kumu.io. And I have been involved with the Humanities Digital Workshop at Washington University. I think even some of the leaders of that team are on the call. Um, this past summer, I led a group of students in creating uh, or developing the St. Louis Integrated Database of Enslavement, which um, was the brainchild of Professor Carl Craver in philosophy. And he and some students began developing it initially. And a group of students uh, that I led this summer have fleshed it out even further. But that database is attempting to bring together disparate records from archives all across Missouri and put the text from those records in one place in a searchable manner so we can begin to have a more complete understanding of enslaved people's lives when the records about them have been severed across different archives. And we're hoping to expand that work to encompass all of Missouri over time. And I hope that I can also work with HCW to build out the network mapping that you saw today. I think those two projects have 
a lot in tandem with each other. Ed Hart asks, has your research turned up any written correspondence between members of the various slave networks? Not too much. Um, in many ways, my attempt to do this network visualization is an effort to fill in the gaps for what we don't know and what we lose by not having written correspondence between enslaved people in these networks. But there are a few letters that exist. Um, they're not quite as relevant to the talk today, but Thomas Brown, who I mentioned, who was forced from the Jesuit plantation in Maryland to Missouri, writes a letter to his enslavers using his Catholic faith to argue why he should be able to buy his freedom and his wife's freedom. And you can tell that he's in, he knows the legal culture of slavery in St. Louis. And he even um, puts at the end of his letter that any reply should be directed to the judge in St. Louis who will oversee future correspondence. So he knows, it seems that he's preparing for if the Jesuits reject his petition for freedom that he might take legal action. And so he's in conversation with the people who are working to fight their enslavement through legal and extra legal means in Missouri, as well as family members in Maryland um, many of the members of the Queen family who I mentioned today had relatives in Maryland who were suing for freedom in Missouri's courts at the same time. So these networks are connected and talking to one another, not only in Missouri, but there are legacies that stretch as far as Maryland as well. I've got to say we've got more questions here than we're going to have time to get to, but, but maybe two or three more. Um, Regarding the lawsuits brought against the Catholic Church, how successful were they? Uh, who represented the enslaved in these lawsuits? And how did the enslaved persons find these people to represent them? Um, I think this question, if you ever get the chance, there's a couple books about um, freedom suits in St. Louis that I'll recommend. One is In the Shadow of Dred Scott by Kelly Kennington. Um, I might be mixing up titles here. There's another one by Anne Twitty and a third by Leah Vanderveld that talk about the legal culture of freedom suits in St. Louis and how enslaved people were able to work within that work to sue for freedom and get a hold of lawyers who would represent them. Some were, uh, lawyers were willing to represent enslaved people out of a sense of anti-slavery sentiment or goodwill, but many others were actually enslavers themselves and were seeking out enslaved people who would sue for freedom in order to make money off of them. But most enslaved people were able to sue as poor people and thus not have to pay as much for a representation were absolved of some of those suits. Um, I'm trying to make sure I answer all the parts of your question. <laughs> Uh, the suits that Charles and Aspasia filed were eventually successful, but if you saw from the timeline, Aspasia especially had to sue multiple times before she was able to successfully become free. And in a lot of times, the courts decided in her favor, but her Catholic enslavers would do things such as appeal to a higher court or take her out of the jurisdiction of the court or sell her to someone else to disrupt the proceedings of the suit that happened with Charles too. And um, there were times when I was going through the records where it even got confusing because um, the jury had decided in favor of Aspasia and she was declared free and yet either she wasn't set free in some instances and she had to sue again, or she didn't feel she could trust that she was actually going to receive her freedom. And there's a couple cases where she sues the same person again, and it's dismissed because the enslaver says, well, this case has already been decided. But that just shows how tenuous and shaky Aspasia felt her freedom was, that she had to make absolutely sure she would be able to be set free and that her enslavers wouldn't keep trying to find ways to keep her in bondage. I think maybe one last question. Um, did formerly enslaved persons remain um, 
well, I'm getting my questions mixed up here. Uh, did those enslaved by the Catholic Church remain Catholic if they achieved their freedom? That was a question I had when I started out my research, and I was really amazed to find that um, the vast majority of enslaved people stayed Catholic after they became free, and that many Black Catholics who left the church left the church many generations after the first generations of freedom. Um, and what was really powerful to me is that these formerly enslaved communities regrouped together in urban environments in many cases after becoming free, after being scattered to many of the places we talked about during this talk, and worked together to build Black Catholic churches like St. Elizabeth Parish in St. Louis, where they could worship free from some of the prejudice and segregation they experience in predominantly white churches and continued to influence and shape their Catholic communities in the next few generations. I think we're, we're, let's squeeze in one last question if that's all right with you, Kelly. Um, mm -hmm. The question here is, has reparation to descendants of former enslaved people been offered by the Catholic diocese in, in Missouri? Not that I'm aware of, though I know that there is an effort by the Archdiocese of St. Louis called Forgive Us Our Trespasses, in which they're beginning to look into the history of enslavement in the Archdiocese of St. Louis. The Jesuit order in the United States has been looking into its history for a longer amount of time, as have other religious communities like the Religious of the Sacred Heart. And some of those particular religious orders are farther along in those conversations about reparations and what repair for this history looks like. I know that the Religious of the Sacred Heart have offered a scholarship for members of the enslaved descendant community and that um, the Jesuits and descendants of enslaved people in the United States have formed a group that um, is raising funds to support racial healing and support descending groups in the U.S. Well, thank you, Kelly, so much for, for joining us today. Um, we are about out of time, um, but we hope you will uh, join us for future programs. And if you uh, would like to see what we're doing in the months ahead, uh, please check our, our calendar on the website for the Society. At, again, it's shsmo.org. So long for now. Thank you. Thank you.